Nimbulivinaka. This is Austin from Fiji. And today I'm giving you a talk on how we can buy time in the face of climate change by adopting paradigms that can accelerate natural adaptation and recovery processes. Many of you have seen the BBC footage of our corals that was filmed in 2009. And all of the corals on that beautiful footage showing them growing in fast motion died from bleaching. This was very discouraging. We had, Im we had involved the community in the site. They had established no fishing areas on the reef. We had done giant clam restocking. It was really very exciting. And when these corals all died, it was very discouraging to me and to all the people in the community. And it basically caused the whole project to fall apart. So five years of work with the communities and on the reef, all gone. Thousands of corals dead. And what did I learn? This is the most important question to ask yourself. Will the corals that you're working with, will they survive for the next 20 or 30 years? If you don't ask that question now, then my answer is that they probably won't. Let's look at Kiribati. This is Christmas Island, the biggest atoll in the world, as far as land area. In 2015 and 16, a mass bleaching hit there that lasted over 10 months. 95% of the corals died. And even though they had these beautiful uh, corals inside the lagoon that could survive to about 35 degrees, all those corals died. People had said, oh, those are heat adapted. They're pre-adapted. They're going to survive okay with climate change. But what happened was when the ocean became 31 and 32, the lagoon became even hotter. And so they died. Just because a coral is heat adapted does not mean it can survive where it is now. We searched for four days and we couldn't find any corals in the lagoon. Very discouraging. The outer cool reefs were also dead. Virtually everything gone. Only a little bit of massive varieties and massive pavona left. This is a giant Pasolopora colony, and there were many of these giant colonies, all recently killed. Walking on the beach of Christmas Atoll, you'll find all of these tabulate corals all over the beach. And right now, today, you cannot find a single tabulate coral growing on this atoll. They are extinct on this atoll. This is the only colony that I found alive of the Acropora. This is Acropora globiceps. It's a digitate colony. And it only a little bit of the colony was alive. Kiribati represents our future. It's the front line of the collapse of coral reefs all over the world. Severe bleaching temperatures hit Kiribati for half the year, every year now, except during La Nina. Even though it is the forefront, only five out of the 33 atolls of the nation have even been surveyed since the disaster. It's like nobody cares. The three columns on the left, the Gilbert, the Phoenix, and the Line Islands, all make up Kiribati, the nation of Kiribati. They are the leaders in the collapse. You can see how they are the most severely bleached of all the reefs. The Maldive Islands, the little red column, uh, it bleached badly in 1998, and most of the corals died. And they were awarded $100 million from the United Nations in compensation. Kiribati has not received a single dollar. These are the lessons that I've learned by working at the front line of the coral reef collapse in Kiribati. That the heat adapted coral populations of hot pockets are just as vulnerable because they exist at the upper limit of thermal tolerance. That without translocation, hot pocket corals are going to die. A cropper species are particularly vulnerable and they're the first ones that face extinction. When a cropper corals become rare, they can be aggressively devoured by parrotfish or other predators. A cropper dominance is often replaced by pasolopora dominance. And then in turn, it gives way to parietes dominance 
as the stress continues. However, the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network will not show that. It only uses coral cover, and so it's a poor indicator of these phase shifts. So we need more fine-tuned measures at genus level. So what we need to do is to create a war to save coral reefs from extinction. They're, we're under attack. What are we doing? Where are the strategic battle plans that we need? Where are the generals? Where are the troops? Where are the weapons and the ammunition? The 50 Reefs Initiative, the Coral Biobank, the Global Fund for Coral Reefs, all of these initiatives are looking at trying to secure the most likely reefs and the corals for the future. And none of these initiatives is working on the front line. They all abandon the front line of the invasion and retreat to the less threatened heartland. So we don't really have a war to save coral reefs from extinction. We have a retreat. The frontline nations are where the vital defensive lessons must be learned and where we have to take our stand now. In Fiji, we are beginning to develop these strategies to defeat climate change impacts on the reef, at least for the next two or three decades. So to keep the corals alive. So using the lessons learned from the front line, we are moving ahead. Lesson one, after the bleaching is over and it's cooler again, the corals that have survived may get eliminated by predators. That the abundance of predators is out the roof with compared to the food that they have available. So you can expect most of your corals that have survived the bleaching, the corals that we rely on for the future, they're going to get wiped out. Even these beautiful butterfly fish can destroy the corals. When a cropper becomes rare, they strip all the tissues off. It's pretty amazing. Parrotfish, oh my goodness. Parrotfish are supposed to be great, but they will turn on your corals. Some species, they love to eat live corals. They will gobble them up. One of the species that really helps to keep coral alive, a cropper especially, on the reef are these Stegastes farmer fish, these damselfish. They grow algae in the bases of the corals, and they do damage the corals a little bit on the bottom, but these are keeping the corals from being killed out by the predators. They can chase the crown of thorns away. The, the, the snails don't seem to be able to get in these corals. The parrotfish will be chased away. The butterfly fish will be chased away. So these fish are extremely important, and I believe they are critical to the adaptation on coral reefs because they keep a crop of corals alive when a cropper becomes very rare. Okay, so lesson two, we establish resistant corals within gene bank nurseries where they are safe from most predators, okay? So here's one of our gene bank nurseries in Fiji. The crown of thorns can't find them. The snails can't find them. This is our major site in Fiji, in the Mamanuda Islands in Malolo District. It is a natural leeward reef and it is a natural hot area. So it's good for stress. And we are in a place that is naturally stressful for good reason. The Mamanuda Islands have a fairly unique double barrier reef system. We have fringing reefs up against the, the islands. Then we have the middle barrier reef and a cool outer barrier reef on the outside. The cool outer barrier reef, the entire um, in, inner reef, the back reef, is mostly dead. These corals were not well adapted, and there have been major cyclones as well hitting this reef. So we have the cool reefs, we have the moderately warm reefs, and we have the very hot reefs. So lesson three is we're translocating the thermally adapted hot pocket corals from these inner reefs to the middle reefs, and from the middle reefs to the outer reefs. And this is our attempt to uh, secure the corals from more severe bleaching events because they are coming. This is Nuku Reef. These corals are in the middle barrier reef. 
They are the same species that are found on the outer barrier reef in the cool, but these are heat adapted. They can take 32 degrees without major bleaching and without coral death. Within the hot pockets, although a lot of those areas are dominated by parietes, there are still some acropora corals and often located within a farmer fish territory. So we will get these colonies out, sometimes sections or even entire colonies if they, if they aren't too big. And we will sample from them and take them out and, and uh, cement them onto these biscuits or cookies and then put them into the nursery. And we start with testing nurseries to test them to make sure that they are strong before we graduate them out to the outer reef. And this is one of our testing nurseries in the near shore waters. These corals have mostly been graduated and taken back out to the cooler nurseries now. This is a stress test nursery in the near shore. And you can see how two of the genotypes, they've been growing for several months and they're bleaching, the two on the left. So these two genotypes will be retired and put somewhere on a cool reef and we won't use them anymore. The two on the right, they are indeed unbleached. They are super corals. They're surviving and thriving in 34, 35 degree water. And these are worthy of growing up large and using them in restoration sites. Okay, lastly, coral reefs are the rainforests of the sea. So why are we using methods modeled after commercial forests and timber production? Tropical forest restoration models actually now involve fewer and larger transplants clustered together. So they take larger sap saplings several meters high, which will attract birds because the birds can perch on them. And then they plant dense patches of those trees, which amplify success for, uh, via habitat creation. So. We're trying to attract the wildlife and that wildlife, the birds in particular, remove predators, the insects, they increase the nutrient flow and they plant new species. So on our reefs, fish are the birds. And by planting larger branches closer together, we will reboot some natural processes. And this is what we're doing. Okay, so we'll take a super coral nursery unbleached at 35. And instead of taking those little branches off of there, We'll harvest the entire adult-sized colony, still attached to the rope. One of the colonies on each of these ropes, we will trim and we will create a new rope that will replace it in the nursery. We do not want to lose any of our genotypes. Okay. So we need to arise to defend the reefs. I am glad you are doing so. It's time to launch a proper war. Let's do it. And Vinaka Vakalevu, thank you to all the donors and partners, and a special loving memory to Taratau Kirata, who just recently passed away. He was in charge of the coral nursery in Kirismas Island.